Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. So, running into a problem with Vlogmas, which is that I've been preparing, I have videos already filmed for the rest of the week, but the plan for today was to, today's the 1st of December, it was to film my wrap up and then edit it and post it tomorrow, but I have a bad cold, <laughs> as you might be able to hear. Um, I've had it for a few days. I had to take a couple of days of work for it. I thought it was recovered enough to be able to go into work today, and I did. And you know when you think you've recovered from an illness because you've been doing nothing but sitting at home and that's fine, but it turns out that actually going out and like teaching a class for a day, I, I was not fine to do that. And I've come home feeling worse than I was feeling yesterday, which is not fun. So I'm going to try and film this video <laughs> because that's what the schedule says. Um, and I can't fail Vlogmas this early, but um, I might sound really weird. And if you don't like how I sound, don't worry, because the rest of the videos for the week, I filmed in a normal, non coldy voice. So let's just give it a go. So I have 10 books to talk about today that I have read over the last two to three months and um, seven of them were audiobooks. I think that really shows um, I've, I've been struggling with reading. Usually it is about 50-50. I listen to a lot of audiobooks um, but recently I just like continued listening to audiobooks and just kind of really stopped reading books physically. The last few days it's really picked up and I'm hoping that that's just going to continue on an upward trend. But that kind of tells you all you need to know. I've been really struggling with reading, been really just tired and stressed generally. And sometimes reading helps me feel better. And sometimes I just don't feel like I can read at all. And that's what's been going on. So let's just get into the books. I'm going to talk about them in the order in which I read them. The first four books are all um, translated fiction. So um these are all ones that I read for the Women in Translation Readathon or Women in Translation Month. Um, I'm only going to talk about two of them here though because I think next week I'm doing a video uh, recommending books written by women in translation and two of these are going to be in that video. So to save time I'm going to just tell you that I read um, Kim Ji-young, Born 1982 by Cho Nam Ju, which is a Korean book, and also There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job by uh, Kikuko Tsumura, which is a Japanese book. I really enjoyed both of those books, so I'm going to be talking about them more in that recommendations video, but I just thought I'd mention them here. So, uh, the next two uh, translated books I am going to be mentioning here because they're not going to be in the recommendations video because I didn't particularly enjoy them. So the first one is um, I Who Have Never Known Men, by Jacqueline Hartman. Uh, this is translated from French. This is a book that I think originally came out in the 90s and recently had a bit of a resurgence because it's a kind of feminist sci-fi type book which is kind of having a moment right now and it was okay. Um, so this is set... I'm, you don't know. You, you find out very little. So I don't know if it's set in the future or if it's set on another planet or what. But you follow um, a young woman who is being kept in a cell, basically, with a bunch of other women. And she's been in there since she was a child. All of the other women are older than her and they're about the same age as each other. I think they're all at least... 10 to 15 years older than her and they're basically just kept in there given food and not much else um and yeah I won't go on to spoil what happens but it's not it's not a very plotty book um but it's also I wouldn't say really a character study it's more of like a kind of philosophical thing like the book is used as a tool to discuss certain ideas for example like what is a woman what is a woman without a man the purpose of life how do you find meaning in life what is important to one's life that kind of thing um and I didn't love it I gave it three stars it wasn't a bad book um I just feel that I mean, I think it is a novella, it was fairly short, but I just also feel like more could have been done with it. Like, you can have these kind of philosophical questions and discussions 
with richer characters like it just kind of felt like none of the characters were very well developed and it, it would have only been a benefit like I understand why this kind of book can't have a really exciting plot because the, the point isn't an exciting plot the point is people in a certain situation what questions does that bring up that makes sense but I don't see why we couldn't have had just more developed characters um it was interesting and made me think and it made some interesting points not all of which I agreed with but like I don't have to agree with it to find it um interesting or thought-provoking so it was fine but I just wish there could have been a bit more to it and the other translated work I read is The Hole by He Young Pyun, which is a Korean book and was also just kind of fine. Um, so uh, it's kind of um, reminds me of like Misery by Stephen King. You follow a guy who has been in some kind of, I think it was a car accident where his wife passed away and he has basically been left completely paralysed and he is being taken care of by his mother-in-law as in the mother of his now deceased wife and so he like cannot move or speak or advocate for himself and she is left to look after him while she is grieving for her daughter he was a professor before and now he can't do anything um and she doesn't always take the best care of him and she sometimes does some kind of odd things or things that he doesn't like um and it, it was okay again it was it was sort of interesting there were some parts there were some scenes that I thought were great but then there were also plenty of scenes that I thought were a bit dull and not loads happened and I felt like it could have been taken to some really interesting places and then it just never quite was I felt like it was a, a great concept and some good stuff was done with it but like could have been so much more and just wasn't so I think it just it was fine it just sort of fell a bit flat for me so next I have a few books that I read for non-fiction November the first one is An Onion in My Pocket by Deborah Madison um this one was pretty interesting this is a book that I was considering buying but I didn't because it's only out in hardback and I'm trying to be better at not just diving in and buying hardbacks because they're expensive. So this is the um like memoir, it's not really like a memoir, she's just like reflecting on her life and telling you her story, that kind of thing. Um and she basically has had an interesting life. She is um she used to work in a restaurant and she has since written many cookbooks. But the kind of, I suppose, interesting part of her story is her connection with vegetarianism. So uh, I think in, I think in the 70s, she got really involved in kind of spiritual kind of movements, which like, I feel like these days, people are a bit more aware of the optics of a big group of white people doing a very eastern influenced um, practice which she doesn't reflect on at all in the book uh, which I thought was interesting but I suppose you know at, at the time it's not something anybody was reflecting on really um, but so she was into all that kind of stuff and through that kind of spirituality and Buddhism and things she became vegetarian because you know, she went to all these different tr retreats for meditation and things, and they were vegetarian there. And then she lived with, you know, a bunch of other people, kind of communal living, and most or lots of people were vegetarian, so they decided to cook vegetarian. She became, like, the cook for the house, and she cooked vegetarian meals for all of the vegetarian people that lived there, and eventually they went on to start a vegetarian restaurant, which at the time was very very unique there were not really many well there weren't many vegetarian options full stop let alone an entirely vegetarian restaurant and so a lot of the things they had to cook they were very innovative like they really had to think like what's a vegetarian alternative to just meat and potatoes which is a lot of what the dishes were at the time so like reading the book now a lot of the stuff she talks about cooking seem really obvious to me because I've been vegetarian my whole life because my parents were um and you know a lot of this stuff does not seem innovative at all to me but at the time 
it was. So that was really interesting. And then she's later gone on to write vegetarian cookbooks and she talks about vegetarianism. I don't really know why she's vegetarian because she uh, nowadays occasionally eats meat and it seems like she was never a vegetarian for any kind of ethical reasons. It just seemed like it was the thing that everyone around her was doing so she did as well. So I thought the book was fine. I liked the parts where she was talking, mostly I liked the parts about her restaurant and I liked the insights into writing a cookbook and what all that was like. But to be honest, I don't really feel like she had anything much to say about vegetarianism because she doesn't really seem to carry the way. She didn't have a strong reason for being vegetarian and she doesn't have a strong reason for not being vegetarian anymore. And she doesn't really have anything to say about that as a movement or about why it's grown so much or how it's been overtaken by veganism. Like a few offhand comments here and there, but didn't really feel like she took any kind of stance on any of these things, which I would have expected from a book where like I'm, I'm assuming that many of her fans, you know, buy her cookbooks are vegetarian. So you'd think that she would talk about that a bit more, but she just doesn't seem to have any strong feelings about it, which I just found a bit odd. So there were parts of it that I enjoyed and I found good, but I also felt like, at parts, I just kind of felt like, did you need to write a book? Yeah, like you got some interesting anecdotes, but did this need to be a whole book? I don't know. So no, it's pretty good. I gave it three stars. It was an all right lesson, but like, I'm okay with not owning it. I'm glad I didn't buy the hardback. Oh, the next book is actually fiction because I read this during nonfiction November. The next book is The Appeal by Janice Hallett. I read this with a friend of mine, which is why I read it like a fiction book during nonfiction November. Um, it was so, so good. This is genuinely, because I have been in my reading slump basically since, when was, was August Women in Translation Month? So basically since the end of Women in Translation Month. And this was like a bright shining spark in the middle of my ridiculously long and dreary reading slump. It was such a good reading experience for me. I bought this kind of just on a whim. It was like being shown in Waterstones like on its own little table and there was loads of them and it looked kind of like a cozy mystery, you know, the little village on the front and it says one murder, 15 suspects, can you uncover the truth? And I picked it up and it was written all in emails. And I don't really read cozy mysteries. I say I don't read, I don't think I've ever read a cozy mystery. So it's not my thing at all. But there was something about it that just intrigued me. And then the fact that it is all written in emails, I thought would be a fun, quick, pacey read. Um, and I just thought it would be fun to, because it says, can you uncover the truth? And I just kind of looked at it and I thought, maybe I can, that would be fun. And I sent a picture of it to a friend of mine who, like my best friend, that we quite regularly will read books together um, and thought maybe it would be fun if we could both read this book and we'd be able to message back and forth and see if we can figure out who done it, kind of. And so that's what we did. And it was so much fun. It was honestly one of the best reading experiences of my life. It is about a small English village called Lockwood. Um, where somebody has been murdered and so this is like a big case file of all the emails between the people involved in the case so it revolves around uh within this small village there's like a drama club uh, where they put on plays throughout the year um just for like as a local community drama thing and it all centers around this drama club and um another big thing that happens at the beginning of the book as they're preparing for their next play is the young child of one of the members becomes really, really ill with cancer and they start fundraising to get her this special expensive treatment from America. Um, and what I loved about this particularly is that you, you don't even know who gets murdered. It's not as if the beginning of the book is set up by saying, hello lawyers, here is a case file, I want you to have a look at it and see whether you come to the same conclusion that I have. From, from all this, what do you think? But they don't start by saying, hi lawyers, this person has been murdered, can you tell me who you think it was? You don't even know who was murdered. So not only are you trying to think, oh well, who's the murder? You're also trying to think who even gets murdered. It's not even if you can go into the book looking for motive because 
who who knew do you need motive against it was so much fun and also um so you know that a murder happens that's like the point of this but it's not yay. right towards the end right the most of the book is just getting involved in all of the small town drama surrounding this stuff like there's a couple of new people that have moved to the area and they join the drama group um and it's like what do people think of them there's a lot of old gossip that goes back decades of people having grudges against each other for various things um there's a lot of like passive aggressive emails which are fun to read it was such a good book my best friend and I were literally like in our own houses at the same time starting on the same page and reading the same pages at the same time as each other and messaging each other being like have you read this page can you believe they said that so what does that mean for this and who do you think about this and then we would ring and talk about our our um, ideas it was so so much fun um this book gave me everything I needed and more um and she has a new book coming out in January and I'm so excited for it. Next is back to non-fiction and next is Cultish by Amanda Montel. Uh, I listened to this one on audio um, and it, it was pretty good. I decided to pick it up as kind of like a, a pop culture-y, easy, interesting read and that's kind of exactly what it was. So Amanda Montel is a linguist and she decides that she's going to look at um, the language around cults and kind of fanaticism and how we see this kind of stuff in many areas of modern life as well as just in what we would think of as like cults and communes um so in places like MLMs or she talks about like Peloton for a while like uh just a bunch of different things that she says you can see use similar language to cults to in order to create a really strong dedicated following and even in things like advertising and like I expected it was pretty interesting I think uh she sort of goes into it talking about how she's going to approach it from a language perspective and as somebody who was a linguist like I also did a language degree and then a linguistics master's and that was kind of what I did was look at stuff through the lens of language um she doesn't go too heavy into it but I think that's probably a good thing because it's not alienating like it's very accessible but her kind of language analysis is it extremely surface level um and I think that kind of describes the majority of the book is that it's a lot of really interesting stuff but it's all pretty surface level I don't necessarily mean that as a bad thing I think it's probably a good thing I get a lot of people on my channel asking for non-fiction recommendations or who are nervous about non-fiction and it they're worried that it's going to be kind of dry or difficult and this is definitely very accessible it's really um well written it's kind of easy to digest easy to understand if you just want to know the interesting stuff and some thoughts on that and what it all means this is a really good book for that but if you want something that's really going to kind of delve into the linguistics and language behind cults this is not quite it but she touches on a bunch of really interesting stuff she talks about um various different quite famous cults like jonestown she talks about things like scientology a lot of all the cults that you will have heard of she talks about them and what they were like and how they got members and how they kind of brainwashed people and then she kind of makes you know conclusions about the kind of language that cults use and just points things out in our society that also use this kind of language and it's just a good thing to be aware of especially with things like advertising or things like MLMs anything that is asking for your money it's good to kind of just be really aware of the way they are speaking to you uh, and if you're being kind of taken in by this kind of language. Next is Women in the Kitchen by Anne William. This is another one that I'd had my eye on for a while and it was an interesting one to listen to an audiobook because it's one of these books that are kind of about food and then every so often there will also be recipes and some of the recipes she read out loud and some of them she just said see the attached pdf. Uh, so that was interesting. I really enjoyed this. Um, I, I like reading books about food and the importance of food and the history of food and um, food's impact on kind of culture and that kind of thing. And that's totally what this book is. It's like a, uh, a short whistle stop 
tour through um, American history and women who were influential in terms of like food and particularly cookbooks. So she talks about like the first cookbook ever published by a woman. Uh, she talks about the first kind of black southern uh, cookbook that was published and what she was like and where she got her influences and that kind of thing. She also has a chapter on Julia Child who I really like. I think she talks about kind of six or seven women who are really really influential. I particularly enjoyed the really really early stuff like the first couple of chapters where she talks about the kinds of things that people were cooking and the kinds of things that were included in cookbooks, the kinds of ingredients that people had access to, the preparation that was involved, like because of the tools that they had, and also just like how brief a lot of the recipes were. Like that's why I said some of them she read out and some of them she said see the attached PDF because most of the recipes from the really earlier periods, um, like the first published cookbooks, are like a few sentences long and that's it. Again, I think I don't really mind the fact that I didn't end up buying this one and I just listened to the audio because um, I'm not sure that I will go back to it. I think it's a really good introduction um, because it, it definitely gave me names of women that I want to look up more books on so like maybe I want to read a whole book focused on um some of the writers of these earlier cookbooks so this was a really good introductory kind of book where it was like here are some influential and interesting women cookbook writers and a bit about their lives and a bit about what they cooked and a couple of recipes from their books and I thought it was a really great introduction and a nice audiobook. Then I have My Life in France by Julia Child. I love Julia Child. Julia Child is not somebody that I grew up watching. Um, my mum's only 48, so I think she was a bit young for Julia Child, but she's somebody that I've discovered in the last few years, and there are some great videos on YouTube of her original TV show. Like, they have whole episodes of her original TV show from, like, the 50s um, on YouTube and I recommend watching it because she's such a character. So I've been meaning to read this for a while and I finally did. I listened to it on audiobook but this is one that I am glad that I own the book. This is a book that I want to own because uh, I really like Julia Child and this is kind of her memoir about her life. She is unfortunately no longer with us so this book um, is kind of written with Alex, Alex Proudhon who is her great nephew, I believe. So this book actually came out a few years after she passed away, uh, but they had been working on a book like this together where she had been sort of recounting her life to him and he'd been helping her to kind of write it into a book. So I think he then just finished it off himself afterwards. Um, and she had a really, really interesting life. That The book kind of starts with when she moved to Paris when she was... I'm not sure how old she was when she moved there. But she moved to Paris because her husband was... I forget his job, like a consulate, some kind of representative for America um, who they sent to Paris. And she, while she was there, she went to the Cordon Bleu cooking school and she discovered a love of cooking uh, and a real passion for it. And she met some French women who were writing a cookbook and they sort of decided that they were going to write an a French cookbook aimed at American audiences, uh, which at the time it was... I mean, I think when you say that now, it just seems like, well, how does that work? You just publish a recipe and it doesn't matter who publishes it or who reads it. But at the time, the styles of cooking were so extremely different. Um, and America was very new to kind of French style of cooking. And also just things like the differences in ingredients and the differences of styles of cooking. So she worked with them on the cookbook and then she eventually moved on into doing TV. If you know anything about Julia Child, it's just, it's about her whole life. I think she's such a fantastic character. She's clearly so knowledgeable, but she's knowledgeable because she's so passionate and hardworking. She has like an incredible work ethic. The amount of time she worked on this book and the attention to detail of getting everything right that she needed to get right. I think she's a fantastic woman and you can just see what a unique person she is if you watch her her cooking shows on YouTube it's called The French Chef if you've not yet been introduced to Julia Child I recommend 
looking her up on YouTube. Um, and if you do know about Julia Child, I would highly recommend this book. It's an interesting memoir, even if you don't know anything about Julia Child specifically, but if you're interested in food memoirs, cooking and cookbooks, that kind of thing, it's a really interesting one and it's filled with such amazing information. So I said I had 10 books to talk about, but I'm actually gonna talk about nine and leave it there because my last one was this but I haven't actually finished it. I've got about 100 pages left and I was thinking I would just wrap it up here seeing as I'm nearly done, but this is a long video and I haven't actually finished so it would be kind of a cheat anyway. I'm planning it on finishing it tonight. So I'm gonna leave it and it will be in my December wrap up, but safe to say I love it, five stars, new favorite book ever. There you go. Okay, um, I'm gonna go and try and edit this video down. Um, I hope you've had a lovely day and a nicer start to December than me. And I will see you tomorrow for my next video. Bye.